Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Intel stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Intel is a semiconductor chip designer and manufacturer. It has the most revenue of all the semiconductor companies. It develops the x86 series of microprocessors which are found in most PCs. It supplies microprocessors for computer system manufacturers such as Lenovo, HP, and Dell. It also manufactures motherboard chipsets, network interface controllers, integrated circuits, flash memory, graphic chips, embedded processors, and other devices related to communications and computing. It was an early developer of SRAM and DRAM memory chips. These chips were the majority of its business until 1981. This company created the world's first commercial microprocessor chip in 1971. It was not until the success of the PC that this became its primary business. During the 1990s, Intel invested heavily in new microprocessor designs, fostering the rapid growth of the computer industry. During this period, Intel became the dominant supplier of microprocessors for PCs, and the company was known for aggressive and anti-competitive tactics in defense of its market position, mostly against advanced micro devices, as well as a struggle with Microsoft for control over the direction of the PC industry. The company's new CEO started in February of this year. He said the company will reclaim its technology lead by 2025. He also mentioned it could triple or quadruple in value. This year, Intel will sell 85% of chips for all laptops. Intel's latest server chips are a big improvement, but AMD still holds the lead in that area. Intel has been slow to react to a power shift towards foundries, like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. Taiwan Semiconductor is no mere order taker. Its operating margins are double those of AMD. So Intel has been verging a two-front battle on designs and manufacturing. Taiwan Semiconductor mainly just manufactures chips for other semiconductor companies, but its market cap is triple Intel's. A decade ago, Intel was worth $118 billion, $40 billion more than Taiwan Semiconductor, Nvidia, and AMD combined. Now Intel is valued at $200 billion, but those other three companies are worth $1.6 trillion combined. So you can see Intel has been growing at a snail's pace, while companies like Nvidia have been growing like a rocket ship. The CEO says he will lean in part on outside foundries for now, while building a foundry operation that will serve other chip makers. Two new Arizona plants are being constructed for $20 billion. The company has also reportedly held talks to buy global foundries for $30 billion. The company is headquartered in Santa Clara, California and was founded in 1968. It can be found on the Nasdaq, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, Zicha, Vienna, Swiss, Colombia, Santiago, Brussels, Kazakhstan, Sao Paulo, Lima, Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, and Bulgaria Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 199 billion market cap. They're trading at $49 a share and they have 4 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they have lots of free cash flow. 14 billion way up to 21 billion. It has dropped in the trailing 12 months to 17 billion, but still 17 billion dollars is a lot of money left over after paying all your bills. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses, and it cannot get more steady than this. It's around 21 billion dollars every single year. Revenue is the sales for the company, and that's also pretty steady, but growing a bit from 71 billion to 78 billion. This is the company's income statement from Yahoo Finance. In a little bit, we're going to look at their income statement from their third quarter. The top line is the revenue of the sales, and it's amazing they have the most revenue of any semiconductor company. But Nvidia and other companies are blowing them away, growing at such a rapid pace. Well, this company is pretty steady each year. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. 
Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that's also healthy and consistent, peaking in the trailing 12 months at $44 billion. Then below that is their operating expenses, then their operating income, which is also pretty steady each year. They do have a decent amount of debt on their balance sheet. So they paid over $600 million of interest on their debt in the trailing 12 months. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is really steady each year, around $21 billion. This is their most recent income statement from their third quarter of 2021. And they also show us the third quarter of 2020. The top line is the revenue, the sales, that was 19 billion. It was about 800 million more than 2020. Here's a breakdown of their revenue. A lot of their semiconductor chips go into computers. 3 billion in sales and desktop computers. 6 billion in notebooks. That went down from 2020. Desktops went up. Their semiconductor chips also go into data centers. That grew from 5.2 billion to 5.7 billion. And Internet of Things, that's also grown a lot from 600 million to 900 million. A big reason their stock has not gone up as much as other companies is because people think personal computers are not a growth industry. But data centers are, and also Internet of Things. And this is Intel. This is a huge company that has lots of patents and lots of really, really smart people. So I would not count them out. If there's an industry that's going to be growing a lot, they're gonna find a way to be part of that. Like for example, electric vehicles, that's a growing industry. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are payroll costs, depreciation, amortization, cost of materials, and their gross profit went up 1 billion from 9.7 billion to 10.7 billion. R&D is a big expense for this company, 3.8 billion because they're always looking to develop and improve their products. 1.7 billion in marketing. Their operating profit is up a bit from 5.1 billion to 5.2 billion. They had a big gain on equity investments. This is their investments in other companies. That big gain in equity investments, that's why their net income is so much higher than 2020. And also their earnings per share are a lot higher as well. I know a lot of people rag on this company, but it's not like they're doing worse. They're growing each year. And they have the most revenue of any company in the semiconductor space. So it's amazing that they're not growing faster. Or at least half as fast as some of these other companies. Some people complain about their technology not being as up to date as other companies. Some people complain about their margins not being as strong as other companies. But I just don't see it. I see them as a really strong company that's really innovative. So I see it as a sleeping giant, it's just gonna blow up one day. This is their statement of cash flows from Yahoo Finance. In a little bit, we're gonna look at their statement of cash flows from their third quarter report. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you can see they generate tons of cash flow. $34 billion in the trailing 12 months, $35 billion in 2020, $33 billion in 2019. This company is definitely not struggling. And they spend a lot on CapEx every year, 15, 16 billion dollars a year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. So they do pay their investors a dividend, but they also buy back lots of stock. They bought back 10 billion, 14 billion, 14 billion, two and a half billion. That's a ton of stock. When a company buys back stock, it's taken off the open market, which decreases the shares outstanding, which gives you a bigger piece of the pie. So your stock price goes up. The two ways to reward shareholders are to buy back stock or pay a dividend, and they do both. As they're trying to grow their different business lines, their foundry business and other businesses, they've been adding a lot of debt. They added 10 billion in 2020. They did pay down four and a half billion. So they increased their debt load over five billion in 2020, and they increased it about four and a half billion in the trailing 12 months. This is their statement of cash flows from their third quarter report. And this shows us the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. And the way you calculate CFO, you start with net income, that was 15 billion. Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. Then you have to adjust for changes in working capital. They pass through a 7 billion depreciation expense that brings down your net income, but that's a non-cash item. So we add it back here on the statement of cash flows. 1.6 billion of stock-based compensation, 2.6 billion of restructuring, 1.4 billion of amortization. That's another non-cash item. They passed through a $1.1 billion gain on their equity investments. 
This is a non-cash item, so we have to minus it out on the statement of cash flows. It looks like they extended $1.6 billion of credit to their customers, so that's a cash outflow. They paid for $1.2 billion of inventory. They added $1 billion of accounts payable. That's a cash inflow. So even though they reported a gain of $15 billion, they actually generated $24 billion of cash flow. This top part is the cash flow from investing section. The first line is usually property, plant, and equipment. That was $12 billion. Another CapEx item of $1.1 billion. It looks like they bought $4 billion of bonds. That's a cash outflow. $3.5 billion of debt securities matured, so that's a cash inflow of $3.5 billion. They bought $26 billion of assets. These are probably short-term investments, so they're not sitting on cash. And $19 billion of short-term investments matured. So they had a cash outflow of $20 billion in their investing section. In their financing section, they added $5 billion of debt. They sold $1 billion of stock to their employees, so that's a cash inflow. They bought back $2.5 billion of stock, and they paid out over $4 billion of dividends. So in their financing section, they had a cash outflow of $2 billion. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have $90 billion of equity, and it doesn't get much better than this. They raised $28 billion from selling their business, and they profited $64 billion from running their business. So you can see it's a really profitable company. Let's look at their capital structure. They have $90 billion of equity, $40 billion of debt. They're 69% equity, 31% debt. And they have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. Their net debt is $5.7 billion. Net debt is debt minus cash. And I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 8.8%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 312 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $284 billion. We divide that by 4.1 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $70. They're trading at $49, so they're trading at a 30% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 1.3%. So I grew their revenue 1.3% for the next four years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers, I divided by these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 23%, so I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 23%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. Simply, Wall Street's valuation is $79. They're saying it's 38% undervalued. 22 analysts priced this stock, and the average price target was 54. The low was 40, the high was 80. This is where the stock has been trading the last 25 years. For the longest time, this was the largest semiconductor company. Nobody could touch them. And this big drop right here is during the dot-com crash. But they survived, and for the next 10-12 years, they traded pretty much sideways. And the stock has improved a lot the last 6-7 years, but not nearly as much as almost every other semiconductor company. Which I think is crazy because they still bring in the most revenue out of all the companies. They have the longest history, so they have the most relationships. But the problem is, if nobody else buys a stock, it won't go up in price, even if the company keeps posting great numbers. Because they are improving each year, their revenue pretty much goes up every year. They raise their dividend each year, they pay a 35 cent dividend. To calculate the dividend yield, you can multiply the last dividend payment by four and take that number, then divide by the stock price. So their dividend yield is 2.85% which they can easily afford. That's 27% of their net income, 33% of their free cash flow. Their industry pays a 1.1% dividend, so they're more generous than their industry, and analysts are projecting them to grow their dividend to 3% in the next three years. The stock is not volatile. It has a beta of 0.5, so it moves half the market. It's pretty much flat the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 27%. The 52-week low was 45, the high was 68. And the stock is on a decline, trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. When the 50-day moving average drops below the 200-day moving average, that's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. And this is a really popular stock. Almost 30 million shares are traded each day. 
Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float. 69% are held by institutions and under 2% of the shares are shorted. They employ over 100,000 people and that's been pretty steady, their employment count for the past five, six years. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $28,000 today. That's an 11% annual return, which is pretty close to the market return. But if you put $10,000 into other semiconductor companies, you might be able to retire today. A bullish sign is when insiders are buying and the insiders are buying the stock like crazy the past year. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 8%, then BlackRock, State Street, Capital Research, and Geode. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have an amazing PE ratio below 10. That means investors are paying $9.40 for $1 of earnings. That is so much better than the market median and average. The way you calculate PE, it's stock price over earnings per share. Earnings per share is simply net income over shares outstanding. They have a really good price to sales of 2.5 and a good price to book of 2.2. They have a great return on investor capital of 19%. They can easily cover their interest payments. They have a high ROE of 23%. They can cover their current liabilities with their current assets more than two times. And their quick ratio is 1.7. Quick ratio is current ratio minus inventory over current liabilities. They have 8 billion of cash on their balance sheet. 26 billion of investments. They also have 8 billion of receivables and nearly 10 billion of inventory. The company is more than well capitalized. They generated over 17 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, over 31 billion of working capital, and they pay out 5.5 billion of dividend payments. So they have over $43 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 14 companies in the same industry as INTC. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. Look how good of a value this company is. A 9.4 PE, the average is 32. A 2.5 price to sales, the average is 8. And a 2.2 price to book, the average is 9. NVIDIA is nearly four times the size. Their PE is 97, their price of sales is 23. That indicates investors are expecting significant growth from this company. Only time will tell to see how much they grow, but it's going to take a lot of growth to be as big as Intel. They have a good price to sales ratio. Their ROE is a little lower than average. They're average in debt, and they're a little bigger than average in market cap. The average is 182 billion. They're 199 billion, and their dividend is higher than average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 30% discount, and this stock seems really poised to 2x, 3x, or 4x, but it just hasn't happened yet. Everyone's looking for the next big thing, and they're forgetting about a giant like Intel that created this industry. But patience is a virtue, but I'm pretty confident the people who hold this stock tight will get rewarded sometime in the near future. I rank their free cash flow 6 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratios 9 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.